our next presentation, we have Glenn Arnold, who's going to talk to us a little bit about um, side dressing on a merch corn. So, great. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I'm uh, from Ohio. I work uh, with livestock manure application as my primary thing that I spend my time on. Um, we live in uh, the Lake Erie watershed, the Western Lake Erie Basin in particular. Toledo is here. This is where the Maumee River empties into to, uh, Lake Erie. And basically we think it contributes about 40% of the nutrient load to the lake. So it's certainly a source of concern for us. Uh, we do have an impaired watershed down here in the Grand Lake St. Mary's, but you can see that the Western Lake, Lake Erie Basin takes in, a, touches about 26 of Ohio's 88 counties, so it's a pretty major source of issues. There's been a lot of lawsuits. Uh, la within the last month or so, the Toledo City uh, voted uh, a Lake Erie Bill of Rights, giving Toledo citizens the right to sue anybody who pollutes the lake. Um, whether that will be thrown out of court someday, we don't know. It has in other states, but it's certainly an issue. The city of Toledo was sued by the Wildlife Federation for leaking PCBs in there from three landfills. And then just two days ago, their county commissioner sued the EPA for not protecting the lake properly. So I couldn't tell you how this is all going to shake out. But just know that we are busy people in Ohio. Where is the limit? <laughs> yeah, where is the limit? Um, we really are emphasizing the 4R program for fertilizer and manure in the state of Ohio. Right product, right place, right time, right amount. It sounds good. It plays well. Do people follow it? That's another question. I think for us in the manure area, timing and placement are two of our big areas we really need to work on. We have dairy, um, not particularly large numbers. We have hogs in the watershed. Uh, but our phosphorus production from the two is roughly about 20% of our phosphorus needs in a watershed. So it's not like uh, some places where they have to export phosphorus out of the watershed on a regular basis. We don't have that. We actually bring quite a bit into the watershed through poultry litter and other types of things. Regardless, this is a typical sample of livestock manure. This happens to be pork sample. And I just want to emphasize a couple things. <clears throat> we use the ammonium nitrogen in our livestock manure to fertilize our corn, to side dress with. So I like to have a two to one ratio between the amount of phosphorus in 1,000 gallons and the amount of ammonium nitrogen or available nitrogen in 1,000 gallons. So if I can get a two to one ratio, and this is about a three to one because we're at 12, 12 pounds of P2O5 per 1,000 gallons or about 36 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 gallons. If I can get a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 1 ratio, then I have a product that I can side dress with. When we look at something like poultry litter, it's more of a 1 to 1. You get about 50 pounds of P2O5 for 50 pounds of nitrogen in poultry litter. But for our liquid uh, hog manure and, uh, as time goes on, perhaps liquid dairy manure, as we move mo more and more towards sand, uh, you can get those types of ratios. Regardless, when you're standing beside a, a um, barn and it's, uh, the hog building has maybe 800,000 gallons of manure to be pumped and you tell a farmer, well, there's probably $20,000 worth of MP and K in there, at least 40% and oftentimes closer to 50% of that is the ammonium nitrogen, which we generally give away in the fall. We, we apply it and it's lost in great quantities. So we're just trying to work on that. We started with small plots, much like they do in Penn State. Uh, just This is a little small plot tanker that we do our work with to, um, to uh, establish some standards. When you looked at that, if you compared the top half of these are pre-emergent uh, plots, the bottom half are post-emergent plots. If you looked at, we, our control was 200 units of of 28% in on both the pre and the post. Then we had 5,000 gallons of hog manure pre and post. Uh, that was incorporated. Then we have surface applied pre and post. Then we had dairy manure, uh, both incorporated and surface applied pre and post. Now, I couldn't get enough nitrogen with just the dairy manure, so we had to add some uh, 28 to, to come up to 200 units of nitrogen in both of these. But if you look at that, the nitrogen hog manure compared to 28, over a five-year average was pretty impressive. About 15 bushel better there, and about 18 bushel there on the post. If you look at the same thing with surface applying that manure, 
we gave away a lot of nitrogen, so we lost the advantage. We still come within about 8 to 10 bushel of incorporated 28%, but not nearly the results that you can get with uh, incorporating your manure, getting it covered up immediately. And if you look at the dairy numbers, even though I don't have them highlighted, they're very, very similar. So the manures work very well if we can get them put in the ground. You're down here at about 164 for the post on the dairy, about 159 on the post on the, or the pre on the dairy. The reason we did the pre-plots is I thought we would eventually move to a drag hose. I did not realize we could drag hose across post-emergent corn at the time we started these plots. This is basically what it looks like when we uh, knife in manure. And the reason we still show these tanker videos, there's lots of parts of Ohio where drag hoses don't work and tankers can still be pretty effective. Small fields, uneven fields, any fields with lots of rocks, you know, drag hose people hate those to start with. So this is kind of what we did, and, and we did this on 50 plots for five years, roughly. And really the yields of commercial, commercial fertilizer versus manure were about break even. Not the gain that we had in the small plots. And I think most of that was about 10 bushel per acre of soil compaction from the heavy equipment would be my best estimate of why there was a break even on average. Eventually we went to the drag hose systems. This is a no-till field, so we have a little bit of difficulty getting a good coverage. But this was a Herod farm that we've done drag, drag hose plots for a number of years now. And when we say plots, he'll, uh, cut, he'll do the field, but he'll leave strips where we'll go in and put commercial fertilizer the same day. So in this situation, this is when he start, first started out with an eight-row applicator. Because of the commercial manure pumper, he had to drive about uh, 4.5 miles an hour. So as we widened our equipment to match our uh, commercial applicator, we could slow down a little bit. And then if this hose can be more full, it'll ride just a little bit better. But many people find that the uh, getting that hose to ride on top of soil is really the key. The other thing that Herod does, and many of our guys do to make these work, is rather than plant these fields in our traditional direction, they'll plant them at a 45 degree angle. Um, it would have been a big deal 20 years ago, but today with grain carts, it's not the big deal it used to be to get further and further away from the truck with your combine. But if, if you do it like this, then a drag hose person could just lay their hose diagonally across that field and they can run that entire field without any help. No hose humper, no second tractor needed, no anything. This is just basically a quick video of harvest time. I just want everybody to see the weed control has been excellent. That was one of the big, first big concerns that many of our people had is uh, are we going to grow a lot of weeds instead of corn? And really that's not been much of an issue for us to deal with. If you look at the um, four years that we kept records with Herod's, started in 2014, 15, 16, and 17, you look at the swine manure versus the commercial fertilizer. Uh, basically, over that four-year period of time, um, he's pretty close to where we were with our small plots. So that tells us that the compaction issue doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, when he did the math, he, his argument was he did not side dress that field, so he saved $75 on side dress nitrogen. His yield gain that he had over that four-year period of time and then the price he had for his corn, he really thought that he, each year he comes out about 125 bucks an acre better. So it's something that he really likes. His soil tests are right where they're supposed to be in a maintenance range. He's the president of the local soil and water board. So a really, really good operator to work with. Um, I think this really bodes well for what we want to do. The other thing that's really important to him and to us is the balance. If you apply the manure properly, it's just about perfect for a two-year corn soybean rotation. And this is an example from his. If we figure 200 bushel corn, we're moving 0.37 pounds of P2O5 per bushel, that's 74 pounds of P2O5 removed and 54 pounds of K2O. Soybeans, 60 bushels, removes 48 pounds of P2O5, 84 pounds of K2O for a two-year removal of 122 pounds of P2O5 and 138 pounds of K2O. When he puts that manure on every other year at 6,500 gallons per acre rate, 
He's putting on 117 and 143 respectively for just about break even over two years. Just doesn't get any better than that. We also can add nitrogen to the manure if we feel like we need to bring the nitrogen level up, like we do sometimes with dairy manure or nur swine nursery manure. So you can play with this and, and balance it if you, if you choose to do that. The university has three of these 12 rows toolbars. You know, we got some grants, some of the larger livestock producers got together and, and put money in a, in a hat for me. Um, this is basically what we've been doing. Uh, we're in a second year of a three-year grant where we run around uh, Ohio and do as many side dress fields as we can with farmers. Uh, this year we haven't got much planted, so we're probably going to put everything together at the same time like we did last year. But this is just one of the three toolbars, and this happens to be very, very sandy dirt. So without that cereal rye stubble in there, that, this dirt would never have held these hoses up. This is a five and a half inch drag hose that we're running in this instance. About 2,000 gallons a minute, and they drive about 3.2 miles an hour to make that work out. You can see the dairy in the background here. Again, this replaces all side dress nitrogen. Most of these guys just put 10 gallons of 28, 28 in the starter so that they have some immediate nitrogen near, near the uh, source. This is simply, remember I showed you earlier that we planted the fields at a 45? We've also spent some time trying to do straight rows of corn. Now you need to understand, if you don't, you need to talk to a commercial manure applicator with a drag hose. You just cannot go across the field continuously with a drag hose unless the turns get shorter. That's why you have, all drag hose people try to make the longest uh, drag, the first drag that they do. But we did work where we are able to uh, do, this is a quarter mile field, when he gets to the end, basically we have a hose humper, or some people call him a hose wrangler. He's basically going to hook on. You can see where we've made these turns in the past. You can see the drag hose here from the last turn. We're coming off this dairy farm right there. And this just gives a, another option. Now, there's a better way than this, but this is one that I happen to have a drone video on at the time. As you ask farmers to move manure greater distances, if they can capture the nitrogen value, they can pay for the transport of the manure or the additional hoses that need to go out further. Any more, as you listen, I, there's several commercial applicators that we follow on Facebook. Um, you know, they'll put the 10 inch lines, go out three, four, five miles now quite easily, move large volumes of manure at uh, 4,000 gallons a minute, things like that. There's a lot of potential. We're this is a this is an industry that's growing by leaps and bounds. They're getting better and better and smarter. Eventually, we intend also to put a uh, tank on that tractor, and that way we won't have the 5x rates on the ends that we have with the, tr with the uh, three point turn that we're doing. And uh, Dave's just going to hook onto that, lock in, and then we're off and running down through the field again. A better place to put that hose humper is halfway down the field. It doesn't require near as large a tractor, and it's not near as much work. And a little bit of corn gets run over, but again, you're saving 60 or 70 bucks an acre on nitrogen side dress. You can lose an occasional plant. And as long as we're hitting these things at the right stage, these plants are generally gonna come back fine. But that's just an example of one of the fields. Again, this actually is a straight planted rose. Um, and if I had a hose humper, I'd locate him right there and let him go back and forth to move that hose to where we want it to be. Whoops. This is what we worked on last year. These were the plots that we got to. We have three toolbars. We have one located here, one located here, and one located, located here. The uh, blue dots we didn't get done. As you guys all know, you work around the weather and the corn got too tall on us in some of these areas. But we, we had a pretty good time. On almost all of those, the manure was as equal or better than the uh, commercial fertilizer. So that was the selling point. Our long-term thought is that farmers will eventually buy their own equipment. Or there's some talk in our watershed of the commercial manure applicators uh, getting some grants to get some of this type of equipment. But most commercial manure applicators are not ready to do corn. They're just not set up for row-ready uh, use of their equipment. They've never had to before. 
The question comes in, how tall can the corn be? We've flattened corn for a number of years. This drag hose should be a little firmer than this one. But we've flattened corn at V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and we've gone both ways on it. This person came this way originally, then turned around and flattened it. So we hit it twice at those stages. The data shows to us, if you look at no drag hose used at all versus 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, five years of, of averaging across, coming down this right side, you're about 170, 170, 168, 172, 167, and at V5, we drop down 40 bushel per acre. So we feel really comfortable through the V3 stage and fairly comfortable through V4, but at V5, that's too tall with a six inch loaded drag hose. Now we're gonna do this also with a four and a half starting this year, just to find out if we could go a little taller. To pull a six inch drag hose, you need a nice tractor and a lot of weight. Um, many, many farmers could probably pull a four and a half with some of their traditional farm um, equipment a little easier. So we wanna try that just to see if we could be a little bit taller on the corn. If we could get one more advance of the stage, we would be in pretty good shape, we think. Just so everybody's on the same page, the first leaf out of the ground is what we consider to be the V1. Once this leaf has a collar, that's V2. Once this leaf has established a collar, that's V3. So this is V3 corn. It's kind of our favorite sweet spot to hit fields if we can. If you, if you hit fields that have just been planted, as long as you're not dragging dirt or scouring too much, I think you're fine. If, uh, if the corn is just coming out of the ground and the field's wet, we've actually reduced the population by about 3,000 by pulling the corn out because it wasn't very well rooted. So it kind of goes back to the type of field. Um, No-tills, anything with cover crops, uh, stale seed beds like we work our ground in the fall and we leave it set all winter long bare and then we go right in and plant. All of those work well with the drag hoses. But you just may, don't, don't go into a freshly tilled field and uh, tick the farmer off by, by piling up large amounts of dirt. Our commercial applicators are excited about the window because this gives them another 30 to 40 days that they didn't have before to apply manure. Their favorite way to do it is not mine, but their favorite way is right after a field's been planted, just come across there and surface apply the hog manure or the dairy manure. Um, I try to discourage this, but I certainly understand why they, don't want, why they do it. And again, you could greatly back off on the side dress nitrogen if you did it this way, but it's still not the same as incorporation, and so you're just going to lose. Uh, Dr. Beagle did a lot of work in Penn State on incorporation of manure and, uh, and the nitrogen savings. But they can go all the way till the corn reaches V3 or 4 and get away with this. In this field, you'll always see the tire tracks from where he drove across that corn. But at 7,000 gallons of, of per acre of uh, swine finishing manure on V3 corn, uh, he didn't burn anything. So it works out pretty well. It's kind of hard to mess this up, except again, farmers being farmers, they'll, they don't like the incorporation as much as I do. Our new goal is to do this very same thing when the corn's freshly planted, but come across here and incorporate with our equipment uh, just to see what the yield loss might be. We did this at this stage with Dietrich knives every 30 inches, and we knocked off uh, about a third of the stand and 40 bushels of yield. So that was not the best way to go. But if we hit it earlier, perhaps, we might be able to make this work uh, that way. The other thing that's possible is when I talk to our precision planting people, they could set their precision planting up to skip a corn plant in whichever spot we want it skipped to make things work out. So there's a lot of potential down the road for this. Since we're in Minnesota and Melissa, I don't know if she's in here or not, but uh, okay, great. This was her, she did her first side dress plots here in Minnesota this year. Um, the light spots were no side dress nitrogen. Everything else got 40 units at planting time. She had a little bit of problems plugging up her injectors on her swine manure, you can see, anhydrous and UAN, it looks pretty dark and pretty good. Uh, Yield-wise, anhydrous ammonia at 208, UAN at 204, and there's the swine manure with the plugged injectors and all at 204. Not too shabby 
for their first year out on this type of thing. Our goal, we want to use liquid manure to fertilize growing crops. It's just another tool in a toolbox, another 30 or 40 days that we can apply manure. We want to capture the nitrogen that's often been lost. Again, a way of paying to move manure greater distances if we're going to stick with the liquid systems we have. We're just trying to integrate liquid manure, in the, I think, in the modern crop production, trying to use this right nutrient, right place, right time, right amount to deem that we're pushing. I like to put a lot of stuff on Facebook. My university Facebook is Ohio State Environmental and Manure Management. Or if you ever, if you guys like Facebook, look me up. Um, I uh, like to put a lot of stuff out there because the, the adoption of this practice is a lot faster through social media than it is through uh, through um, you know journal articles and that type of stuff. Questions at all? Yes. Any effort put towards looking at different uh, corn varieties and their ability to withstand the? Not yet, but that's an interest of several. I know if you spray the, the field right before we go in there, three days later, we, with 2,4-D products, we can snap corn off pretty easily at different stages. So you don't want to work against yourself and make the corn more brittle than it already might be. Also, we do our research with the in the morning with the corn being the most brittle it can. So if a person had a field that was later in the afternoon, they might be able to get away with a little taller corn than what we do in our research plots. But right now, V4 is a limit. Anything else? Uber. All right, thank you. Great job.